Welcome to St. Laveau's World Cinema. I'm your hostess, Betty St. Laveau. On this show, we talk about foreign movies, and I try not to give too many statistics, just kind of want to talk about the films. Uh, we're going to look at two today in particular. Uh, I wanted to wrap up Hong Kong filmmaking and uh, the Nigerian film industry. I'm going to go more into the Nigerian film industry because I think uh, Nadia Denton, this archivist that I came across, who studied at Oxford, has an incredible, incredible uh, encyclopedia that I really need to delve more deeply into in order to discuss the history of, of, um, of filmmaking there. At the same time, uh, I'm going to hit on maybe a little bit towards the end of this episode. We're going to focus on one French movie and one movie made in Hong Kong. First, we're going to start off with Jean Renoir's beautiful The Rules of the Game, okay? Uh, it was produced by Claude Renoir and Jean Jean, made by the Gaumont Film Company. It was released July 7th, 1939. Runs about 110 minutes. Uh, it had a budget of five million, five hundred thousand and five hundred dollars Hope I read that right. Uh, Marcel Dalio, Noah Gregor, Paulette de Vost, Roland Toutain, Jean Renoir, Mila Parley, Gaston Madot, and Pierre Bacnea make up the cast. And you can see that the director was also in the movie. Their father was the famous painter, uh, I want to say Auguste Renoir. Hope I've got that right. Now, the plot's a little convoluted. I first saw it as a teenager at Dartmouth Film Society, and I totally, totally enjoyed it. As the years go on, I see it as um, not as fun as I thought, but I still love this movie uh, very much. It's a um, comedy of manners, uh, but when it came out, the critics treat it like an episode of Golden Girls, unfortunately, okay? Uh, and I'll go into that in a minute. Now. Part of the plot is there's an aviator in love with a marquis's wife. The marquis is getting tired of his mistress. So the marquis and another friend try to get the aviator and the mistress together. Hope that makes sense. All right. They, the, the wife, his wife is tired of her lover and he, the husband's tired of his lover. France is so not like America, okay? Um, especially 1930s um, or 40s or 50s America. Now, the mistress is a pest, and the aviator, he's a droopy drawers. O Octave, Octave, played by the director, Jean Renoir, is sort of the go between between all of them. He's actually one of the nicest characters in the whole flicker. Um, the The production was, uh, it came together because Jean-Claire, uh, Julien Dormel, Jean Gabin, uh, actor who was lover of Marlena Dietrich, and Simone Simon formed a production company like United Artists over here. Um, Mary Pickford, uh, Charlie Chaplin, and Douglas Fairbanks. The artists wanted to control their product, all right? Um, but the movie, which is a lot like The Marriage of Figaro, and what's that other? Midsummer Night's Dream, didn't play well with a uh, audience who was witnessing the partition of Austria by Germany and the invasion of Poland. And so as uh, Jean Noir was trying to illustrate the cynicism of people whose lives were about to be changed forever. No one wanted to see it. No one, no one liked it. They actually probably didn't like it because they knew things were not going to stay the same and that the world was changing. And over in Europe in the last 50 years before World War II, it certainly was changing quite a bit. Um, 
Now, in real life, Nora was the wife of Prince Ernst Rudiger von Stahenberg, and he was an anti-fascist. Uh, when the Anschluss happened, they moved to France. She was Jewish, and uh, Jean uh, cast her in the movie and ended up falling in love with her, even though his love wasn't requited. When the movie came out, anti-fascist groups made demonstrations. They heckled the movie, made it really hard for the movie to be seen uh, because she was Jewish. Uh, the political situation was tense, but the set was a happy one. The director kept everyone happy. Uh, when war was declared, a bunch of people left to enlist, a bunch of men left to enlist. Um, uh, many electricians and technicians left to join the French army when Germany invaded Czechoslovakia on March 16th, 1939. So this hampered the production. Uh, even though he fell in love with the actress. He ended up marrying uh, the family nanny shortly. Of, uh, he, he commenced the relationship with her after the filming was done, and she became Mrs. Wenoir eventually. Um, he wanted to screen it at the World's Fair in New York City, but it had had such a bad reception in France, he decided not to bring it over. Um, one historian said that uh, Nora, the lead character's performance, this lady that the director was so in love with, was a haunting, as haunting and bewitching as looking at a plastic giraffe, all right? And that's up there with Sybil Shepherd's performance in Last Long Love all the charisma of a dead hamster. Sometimes it's not easy on the actress, especially when the director has his heart set on you and maybe someone else should have done the part, correct? Uh, so I find that this happens frequently. In, back in the day in France, Jean Cocteau would do a play or Stravinsky would do some ballet and sure enough, the movie was booed all to hell by the right-wingers. There were fights. Someone tried to set fire to the theater. Uh, but that, I mean, that, I think that even happened with Voltaire back before the French Revolution. So to me, it's almost yawn, but of course they were going to try to burn the place down, OK? Now, the postscript to all of that, uh, Italy had also annexed Albania, and Franco was in Spain. So before World War II, the map was different. During the war, the map was different, and after the war, the map changed, right? And so did uh, certain ways of thinking. After World War I and after World War II in Europe and England, people wanted to be more relaxed. Uh, they didn't want to, they'd seen so much destruction and death, they wanted to be happy. And so the upswing of that was that the movie started to become accepted after a while. So when the bad press was happening, Renoir did everything to appease the critics and the public. He cut scenes. He cut scenes of himself out. He thought because he put himself in the movie, it detracted from the plot. Actually, he's a, a linchpin. He's very important to the plot. Um, the critics said it was depressing, immoral, morbid, an un, it had an undesirable influence on the young. However, it's a war film that doesn't have a speck of war in it, which, is, which I also liked it too. I knew, a little bit more, I knew a little bit of history back then. I understood it was a post-World War II movie. Um, so what ended up happening was that the film lab was bombed in 1942. In 1946, uh, the 85-millimeter print was copied. In 1950, they thought about reissuing it. In 1952, uh, it was uh, put out in theaters again, and it was declared one of the greatest films by Sight and Sound. In 1956, the excisions that Jean Noir had did were restored. 
And in mid-1959, in mid when, when Waugh saw all that was stored, except for this one little bit of him that they didn't find, he cried. Uh, he loved it. The Venice Film Festival called it a masterpiece. I think there are three reasons why this is a great movie. <coughs> Pardon me. Number one, the deep focus photography, some critics said. Number two, Mr. Paul Mooney. People believe what they see. And as the French audience and the French critics were watching this movie, they believed what they saw. They saw the mirror image of their own society, decadent, about to be transformed, and they didn't, they didn't want to see it. So they, be, they believed that that was actually the way society was. Of course, that's not the way society is, but... And then three, uh, the critic Robin Wood said, this film operates on all levels, and it certainly, certainly does. When I was watching it, I liked it on my emotional level. I loved what I was watching it on my physical level. My brain was going off, you know. Uh, I like all types of movies. I really loved French movies back then. I loved listening to different languages. I don't mind reading a film. so. I really enjoyed it. As I get, get older and see it again, it's not that it's depraved or immoral. It's a little cynical, a little silly to me. These people running around trying to um, fix one another's lives, but uh, one of the actresses in the movie, if I can find her name, Paulette Dubose, plays a maid, a character called Lisette. I wonder where I've heard that name before. And usually when you do see the name Lisette in novels, she's always a maid or um, usually a maid, okay? Now, there is a quote uh, summing all this up. Each click has its own rules and you must follow the rules of the game that the click says in order to stay within the click, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, I saw clicks in high school, but I don't really experience them much as an adult. I also came across a term called objective humanism, which kind of scares the heck out of me. Um, hopefully it doesn't have anything to do with those crazy existentialists that say nothing is real and everything doesn't exist. Very annoying, okay? Uh, we all have emotions, feelings, and this chair certainly exists, all right? So the next movie I would like to discuss, which is very, very much in my heart, is Wong Kar Wai's Chunking Express, okay? This has Takeshi Kenshiro as Hi Kuo, Tony Leung Chue as Cop 60, 6, oh, 663, Takeshi Kenshiro plays Owa Cop 223, Bridget Wen, looking like Greg Abel, Fei Wong plays Fei, Tom Baker, Chan Kum as Chin, Quan Li as Na, Wang Chi Ming, Ling Song, and Cho Cheng Sing. All right. Um, the film posters were designed by Sydney Wong, and um, Fei Wong, who plays one of the heroines in the movie, is a big pop singer. So she's bigger in China than Madonna is over here. All right. And when you watch. Uh, Quentin Tarantino's edition of Chunking Express, uh, Express, and I think it's out of print. Um, he's he he does an intro and outro, and at one point behind him, you see her in some crazy outfit singing. It, it looks great. She she's a real rock star. This gal. Okay, it came out in March, uh, 19, in 1996 on March 8th. Um, it had a limited run. It was under Quentin's Rolling Thunder which is a, a production, which was a subsidiary of Miramax. And it also belongs to Criterion Collection. Now, both versions are out of print, I think. I happen to own, um, I happen to own a version on VHS, which makes me so happy. I haven't seen it around my library lately, but I know I've got it. Criterion has resumed the rights, and as of last month, you can catch it streaming on the Criterion channel, and please do, it's one of my favorite movies in the whole world. Okay, so Wong Kar Wai made this while he was editing. I, he made this while he was um, 
on a two month break making his opus Ashes in Time. The screenplay was not complete before the filming began. He wrote the second story, there are two stories. The second story is my favorite. Um, the third story he wrote became, he, he wrote three stories, but he left the third story out of the movie. The third story became uh, a plot concerning a hitman in love called Fallen Angels, all right? So uh, Wong Ka grew up in uh, Tuse Sha Sui, and he wanted to film the movie where he had grown up. Now, I'm trying to think. I wonder if we should go into plot. We'll go into plot first, and then we'll go into what uh, the meaning of Chunking Express. All right. Two policemen in two different stories are in love with two very different women. The stories kind of overlap. The first story concerns a young man whose lover, May, we're in the month of May, has left him, and he's very sad. And um, he runs into uh, this sort of spy hit lady named uh, She's the Gal in the Blonde Wig, and that who that's who uh, that's who Bridget Lynn is playing. Bridget Lynn, by the way, is uh, I said she's looking like Greta Garbo. She is Asia's Greta Garbo. She fantastic film career went into retirement years ago. I think that she's still retired. The second story has to do with another policeman. That's Tony Leong. I love him. And um, his lady has left him also. But the girl who works in the grocery store has plans for him. All right. So uh, both these men are dealing with the breakup. And both of them are cops. And are both doing their jobs. But they're both so heartbroken in so many different ways. Uh, uh, Mr. Um, Takeshi Kanshiro's cop, he's just kind of, he kind of young looking and he's like sappy sad. But Tony Leung, he's like desperate sad. It's, it's really something to watch. And it's something to watch Fei Wong pull, pull her life together while she's helping him out too. You're going to love it. Now, this is shot in a place called Chungking Mansions. And basically, we don't have anything like this here. I've got the coordinates for it. 22, 17, 46, 94 North, 114, 10, 20, point 89 East, all right? It's uh, 36, 44 Nathan Road in Hong Kong. Sim Shao Sun Kowloon is a district. And it's a Kowloon walled city. It has guest houses, curry restaurants, African um, bistros, uh, sari stores, foreign exchange offices. Uh, it's called the unofficial African quarter of Kowloon, OK? Uh, 4,000 people live there. And it was built in 1961. There are 17 stories. And they're list, uh, I think um, they're listed uh, A, B, C, D, E. Um, Middle Easterners, Nigerians, Europeans, Southeast Asians, such as Sri Lankans, Bangladeshi, Pakistanis, Nepalese, Indian, Indian, and Americans live there. Um, Professor Gordon Matthew in 2007 said 120 nationalists passed through Chungking mansions in one year. When I go to Hong Kong, I would love to see it. What a place. We just don't have anything like that. So. He shot it there, and when you see a lot of the chase scenes, uh, you're seeing uh, chunking mansions. When you're seeing to uh, Tony Leong's apartment, that's the apartment of, I want to say, the second assistant director, or one of the screenwriters. Uh, one of the cr it was one of the crew's apartments that they shot, uh, shot that story in. Love, 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 love it. So, um, I really would like you all to check that one out. And I haven't seen Ashes in Time or Fallen Angels, but I would love to. Wong Kar Wai is one of my favorite directors, and he's one of the fathers of Hong Kong cinema. Okay, So um, that will do it for that one. Beautiful, beautiful movie. And the soundtrack has a couple songs that will be familiar to you. There's 
Mamas and Papa sing California Dreaming, and then the Cranberry song at the end, uh, Dream, is sung by Faye Wong and Cat Nice. So, I think that that's it. Uh, let's see. It made $7,678,549 Hong Kong. Um, it opened it opened on a weekend and went to gross only six hundred and six hundred two hundred thousand dollars but um a little known gem please check that out okay now for my nigerian um segment i would like you all again to read the nigerian filmmaker's guide to success written by nadia denton and it predicts the future of the industry and looks beyond nollywood okay um, it's a $3.3 billion a year industry, which is incredible, all right? That's a lot of money. And um, however, piracy is a problem and the producers don't see uh, their money a lot of the time, all right? They don't really see any payback from that. I think that that's it for me today. I'm your hostess, Betty St. Laveau. You've been watching St. Laveau's World Cinema here at Walker. I'd like to thank Gender and Building for its continued support over the years, Kellogg Hubbard Library in particular, and my mother, Sharon Ardella Paris Warfield Otisanya Claret, who taught me to appreciate great movies, especially foreign ones. Until next time, babies, stay away from those bad movies. Ciao.